Okay, so our first, so this is our um, six, five minute first session um, session of the, of the program today. Uh, I want to remind the speakers to try and well, to keep to five minutes, please. Um, and our first speaker is Fatima Al Ghazawi on reactive printing ZIF eight interfaces. Over to you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Fatima Al Ghazawi, BS student. Today I am present part of my thesis is reactive printing of ZIF eight interfaces. My supervisor, Dr. Bauer Dutman, and Dr. Christopher Isak. Firstly, what the name is it? This is the United Amidazole framework. It's one type of metal organic framework. What the name metal organic framework of MOTS? is a new class of mineralized material. They are constructed by metal as a node, linking together with the ligand as a link to make the framework. Most have attractive properties, such as have uh, high surface area, high velocity. So most as a film, more attractive to, for using in the many applications, such as uh, gas absorption, catalyst, but many uh, methods to using to prepare MOS as an interface have some problems, such as difficult control of thickness of film, difficult make uniform film. So the silk he starts using printing, uh, printing to prepare MOS as a film, but also this method have some problem because the research using uh, make in any of the uh, most then printing. This method has some problems such as block the nozzle after printing five to ten light. What the novelty in my team, in my work, I will use in a new methodology called reactive extrusion printing. What the idea of this uh, method is take the surface treatment by physical or chemical treatment, then prepare two reactive ink and the printing by using the reactive nozzle by two nozzle and the, the uh, reactive ink will be mixed on the reaction on the surface to prepare the pattern of the mops. And also I will study how it affects some condition of reaction such as the uh, solvent sort of system, number of the layer, uh, constant uh, molarity, ratio of the ink, how can it affect on resolution uh, and the growth mops on the surface. Because my I want to prepare zip, so I'm using zinc metallic as a uh, as a metal ink and uh, uh, amidazole as a ligand ink at the molarity ratio eight to one by using ethanol and water as a solvent system. This is my uh, design of uh, active uh, nozzle. In here, just I show the how can the solvent system affect on quality of the printing and growth marks. I see when I using uh, water and ethanol uh, can lead to growth uh, good pattern of the zip on the uh, on the surface. Uh, and there are some difference in the quality between two different uh, to the sample. This depends on the physical properties of the ink, such as contact angle, surface tension of the drop. And also, SEM, so there are a difference between uh, to the sample in the size and the shape of the crystal. Now the question is, is the, to, uh, this sample have the same framework or a different? So I study the, I'm uh, using the XRD. The XRD show the ZIP8, uh, ZIP, uh, by using ethanol, lead to growth ZIP8. But ZIP, uh, by using water, lead to growth ZIP8. But, and also, after gas absorption, ZIP8 is still the same, no change, but with the ZIP-L change to ZIP-8. And more important in this method, I'm not just using to prepare pattern of the, of the MOS, and also I study if this material can improve in properties of the framework, and I measure the surface area for all the sample, and I compare with the, my result with the literature of this uh, uh, framework. He showed me there are improving in the properties of the MOS. In conclusion, my, my conclusion, this method can using a new methodology to prepare MOS as a better and also can improve in properties of the, uh, of the MOS and they can open in a way to uh, uh, new health if in the uh, growth and make better of the MOS in general. In the, in the end, just I want to say thank you for my supervisor and also all help me in the finish my, uh, my thesis.
Very interesting. I think in the, in the interest of time, that we'll have to move on to the next speaker, but a very interesting project. Thank you for that, uh, Fatima. So the next speaker, please, um, will be Mitchell Sinclair Glover. Hi there. Um, I just need to share my slides. So. <coughs> And he'll tell us about development of inno innovative full fitness human model. Over to you. Right, um, thank you very much. So uh, we actually um, decided to reframe the talk based on what I've been working on in the first nine months of my PhD, where we've been looking at optimizing the differentiation of pluripotent stem cells for tissue engineering applications. And obviously this is that 3D bioprinted full thickness skin. Um, so first of all, a human pluripotent stem cell is an unspecialized cell capable of self-renewal and possessing the ability to differentiate into specific tissue lineages of the body. And this allows for the creation of humanized models for development and disease modeling, um, and also means that they have many potential applications in regenerative medicine, drug discovery, and tissue engineering applications. However, um, traditionally cell differentiation of pluripotent stem cells um, has been limited by the generation of heterogeneous populations, intra and inter variability in differentiation, cellular identification, as well as cellular maturation and functionality, as well as the assays that we actually use to determine these parameters. And overall, this reduces the potential usefulness of stem cells for applications such as um, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. And so I'm going to frame this talk today and how we can approach these challenges based around what I've had to do for the generation of sensory neurons for our skin model. And so our lab has previously established um, this differentiation protocol, which produces these beautiful functional sensory neurons, but unfortunately it wasn't suitable for my tissue engineering applications. So first of all, um, it has this pretty complex differentiation method where we go through these different progenitor cell stages, including 2D to 3D to 2D and then migratory cell populations. And also we have this um, viral delivery system for a transcription factor that helps to push the differentiation. And so all of these different components kind of add extra complexity, which increases variability and the stages where things can um, go wrong. And also we can't really control for the amount of cell numbers that we produce in this, which is a pretty important requirement for tissue engineering. And so I created this optimized um, protocol for the generation of sensory neurons by kind of breaking apart this protocol. And um, I'll show you the kind of separate bits that I included to make that happen. So first of all, um, our lab research assistant, Sarah Mille, generated a um, CRISPR edited cell line that has an inducible construct for the expression of this transcription factor that drives neurogenesis. And so this means that we can selectively express um, neurogenin 2 when we want to push it at the right developmental timing stage, and we don't have to use that viral delivery system. The next thing we, that we did was we used a commercially available differentiation kit so that we wouldn't have to go through this complex two-week um, kind of progenitor cell stages. And um, obviously being a commercially available kit, it go, undergoes a lot of quality control testing. And um, I guess in the end, we were able to produce these progenitor cells in five days instead of two weeks. And we're able to scale up this system as it's all done in 2D. So the next thing that we did to optimize the system was that we actually harvested the cells and sorted them using a magnetic cell sorting system so that we were able to separate out the contaminating cell populations and improve the hom homogeneity of our um, produced cells. And then finally, for the differentiation, um, we utilized the CRISPR edited uh, system in the cell line so that we were able to express neurogenin 2 and produce um, our sensory neurons. And we completed molecular characterization looking at a range of cell markers. So for example, here, brain 3A and islet 1, which act epistatically to produce our sensory neurons. And then so arguably most importantly, we completed some functional testing because not only do we want our cells to look as they should and express the right proteins, but it's, so, it's super important to make sure that they're actually functionally behaving in the way that we expect them to. And so we're completing electrophysiology studies as well as calcium imaging to make sure that this is the case. So I guess in summary, um, I wanted to use this as an example of how we can approach uh, traditional challenges in pluripotent stem cell culture and optimize them towards tissue engineering applications. So we showed that we were able to reduce protocol variability, promote reproducibility and cell homogeneity um, by using this transcription factor method, a more defined biochemical culture method, as well as sorting. And there's other systems available out there like the electrostimulation that a lot of other groups at ACs are using. And specific to en tissue engineering, we showed that there's really a need to streamline and have scalability in your cell differentiation protocols. 
And so finally, we also completed comprehensive functional validation and molecular profiling to show that we are generating the cell types that we require for our tissue models. And overall, this is helping us to push our cells towards tissue engineering applications and regenerative medicine. So at the moment, I'm now working with these cells to 3D bioprint them in hydrogels. Thanks very much. Very nice. Um, again, I think um, we're not going to be able to have time for questions given the time short time frame. But that was a very nice talk, and I think uh, anyone's got questions put in the chat, perhaps. Uh, otherwise, we'll go on to our next speaker, um, it's Yong Jo, talking about dependent electron transfer array by exploiting selective intermolecular interactions between mixed liquid electron donors and electron receptors. That's a big mouthful, right? Um, it's Yong Jo, over to you. All right, thank you, Maria. Um, I'm Insel. Um, I finished my PhD student here in Wollongong. Um, my research work, um, like I'm studying the fundamental research of electron transfer using uh, redox active molecules uh, at the charge transfer interfaces, particularly focusing on uh, the structural effect of affecting electron transfer rate. So today, I would like to briefly introduce one of my recent research work. Um, titled here, Substrate Dependent Electron Transfer Rate. Exploiting selective intermolecular interactions between mixed ligand electrolytes and surface bond molecules. Um, so, redox active electrolyte has some like, requirements, for, such as um, electron uh, redox potential, solubility, uh, diffusivity, and electrochemical stability. Um, but it's often not very hard to find a single molecule that uh, meets all these requirements. So, uh, having like employing multi redox electrolyte in one system could be an, um, actually an option to address this problem. So. If you look at this uh, like diagram on the right hand side of the slide, uh, here is an example of the multi redox electrolyte system in a membrane free for electrochemical device. So basically, different uh, redox, redox molecules having a different energy level are um, dissolving in one electrolyte system. <coughs> so, electron transport takes place uh, in redox cascade, system, uh, cascade direction scheme. So, basically, redox flows from um, like the higher, higher energy level to the lower. But um, this one has some like um, limitation, which is the energy loss by the electron transfer itself. So maybe uh, exploiting some structural effect uh, without increasing the redox uh, potential uh, will be a good option to um, like solve this problem. But there are still a very limited number of uh, studies uh, working on this fundamental electron transfer behavior. So my uh, open question is that to what extent the different uh, different molecular structure of this uh, redox active molecule in this mixed electrolyte system can uh, influence electron transfer behavior. So basically, um, um, so, so basically, I here uh, employ two different uh, ligand structure, ligand structure, uh, ligand structure to uh, have a like, mixed electrolyte, electrolyte, uh, which enable actually um, same redox potential between different redox, redox compounds, but having quite significant difference in their molecular structure. So by uh, employing uh, two ligand structure with um, different alkyl chains. One has methyl uh, substituted BP and the other one is monoxide substituted BP. Um, you have um, like four different uh, ratio of this ligand, uh, ligand into one electrolyte system. So basically, uh, yeah, from here, I'll just uh, for convenience call this methyl SC1 and uh, this nonyl SC9. So basically, in, the, in case of mixed ligand electrolyte cases, uh, electrolyte B and C, we have four different uh, cobalt complexes in one electrolyte system because of the ligand exchanging reaction. So they have an equilibrium state uh, forming these uh, four different molecules uh, in one electrolyte system. So basically uh, uh, two homolactic complexes uh, which only have one sort of um, ligand structure uh, which is C1 and C9 and two other <coughs> uh, heterolactic complexes as well in one electrolyte system. So basically, uh, as you can see in the right hand side of the slide, CD confirmed that they have the same uh, electro uh, redox potential so that uh, we can just uh, focus on their structural effect, not their redox potential effect. So basically, <clears throat> I measure, uh, sorry, maybe I can uh, electron transfer between uh, this mixed ligand electrolyte with uh, the surface bond molecule attached to the electrode surface. Um, the electron transfer was measured using transient absorption spectroscopy. Um, and the electron transfer was performed uh, between uh, this mixed, mixed uh, electrolyte and the two different surface bond molecules. So in one case, if there's no RK chains on the 
um, surface, mo surface bar molecule, electron transfer uh, was actually decreased uh, with increased ligand ratio, which means more C9 components in the electrolyte. And I did some simple modeling confirmed that whenever C9 is present in the electrolyte, uh, electron transfer rate of hetero heterolactic complexes were the same as uh, the homolactic C9, fully C9 substrate medium. Yeah. And on the other hand, when the uh, surface bound molecule has also RT chains, actually it followed the same model, but the uh, trend was totally opposite. So with the increased C9 ratio, it should actually enhance the electron transfer rate. So basically that was uh, explained uh, with this uh, split diagram. So because of the uh, long RT chain, when there's no RT chain on the uh, surface bound molecule, it acts as a barrier. So the electron was slowed down, but when it, when it has, uh, when the surface bound molecule also has the RT chain, it actually forms London dispersion forces with uh, the non chains on the electrolyte so that electron transfer was enhanced. So it's actually a, a substrate dependent electron transfer behavior. Yeah, so I believe uh, this kind of concept will, uh, can inspire some uh, people working on multi-substrate uh, photocatalytic systems so that um, different um, electron transfer steps can be controlled like, simultaneously with um, this selectivity molecular attraction. For example, uh, in the case of competitive reaction with uh, the reaction for the product, it could be slowed down, while uh, in some other cases, electron transfer can be enhanced. So uh, I'd like to thank to uh, my co-authors, co including my supervisors and funding sources from ACS and Discovery. Um, thank you for your attention. Very, very, very nice talk. And lots of questions, but no time for questions right now. I'm sorry. So maybe again in the chat if people have questions. Um, but a very nice talk. Our next speaker, thank you, Sujani Abbe Wadena on textile-based electrofluidic platform for cell culture analysis. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sujani. Uh, my presentation is on textile based electrofluidic platform for cell culture analysis. Electric field can actively control fluid flow in capillaries using electrosmotic uh, flow uh, and separation of uh, analytes using electrophoresis. Uh, capillary electrophoresis is a powerful separation technique used in cell culture analysis. However, uh, limitations of conventional capillary electrophoresis, such as high cost, closed capillaries, and poor real time analysis, have made textile based electrophoresis more attractive. Uh, in this research, uh, we have combined textile based electrophoresis platform with cell culture. The idea is to uh, separate and analyze and metabolize secreted from cells. Uh, we have uh, fabricated uh, polyester braid and cochal textile structures using braiding machine. In the cochal textile, co is nylon fishing line, shell is uh, polyester braid. And cytocompatibility was measured after seeding cells on these textile structures. And uh, these lighted cell staining images and crystal blue assay results show good cell viability on this textile structure. We think that uh, textile fibers and uh, open capillaries uh, provide good environment for cell attachment and cell proliferation. Apply electric field on cell culture. Uh, here, the major problem is uh, their incompatibility. Uh, Cell culture medium cannot be used as uh, electrophoresis buffer due to its high ionic strength and uh, small anions and cations. Therefore, we measure uh, cell viability with electrophoretically favorable buffer solution. And we observe that cell viability was drastically decreased uh, with the time. And apart from that, uh, cells do not like electric field. Uh, cell viability was measured uh, soon after applying electric field, and uh, there was a significant, however, there was a significant uh, uh, cell death even after applying uh, electric field for five minutes. Uh, cell survival only at uh, low voltage, which is not sufficient for the electrophoresis experiment. Therefore, to resolve all these issues, we recently came up with the new textile platform where electric field is directly not applied on the cells. Here, uh, there are two braids crossing and touching each other perpendicularly. 
and uh, there are four buffer reservoirs uh, connected to the terminals of uh, base and uh, 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 leftmost reservoir has cell culture and rest of the reservoirs has have uh, electrophoresis buffer and no voltage is applied on the cell culture reservoir uh, the electric field is applied on second and third reservoir fourth one is grounded Therefore, electrosmotic flow is from anodes to cathode. So, this electrosmotic flow uh, draws calcium medium in uh, first reservoir towards the intersection. This mechanism was proved using protein on the gray and in the reservoir. In both instances, uh, when fluorescein reaches the intersection, it gets diluted by uh, electrophoresis buffers uh, flushing from anodes. And then move towards the uh, cathode. Uh, this dilution is very important to uh, decrease the high ionic strength of culture medium. And then we uh, measure the cell viability with uh, this new textile platform. Uh, cells were uh, cultured on the uh, textile spiral. A uh, large surface area of this spiral uh, allow accommodating more cells on it. And uh, we observe uh, significant cell viability uh, with this textile uh, platform after applying high electric field for one hour. Um, we think this is an exciting approach uh, to analyze cell metabolites while keeping cells alive. Because uh, even without applying electric field directly on the cell cultures, still we can but drag the things in the uh, cell culture as well towards our uh, analysis zone. So finally, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to my supervisors, Peter Zillian, and all other IPRI, ACS, and TRICEP staff and members. Thank you. Very nice. Once again, though, no time for questions. I'm sorry, but uh, it was a very nice talk. Uh, our next speaker is Thomas Blesch from Monash Studies on of an Iron-Based Symmetric Non-Aqueous Redox Flow Battery. Thomas, over to you. Thank you. I'll just get that in presentation mode. Okay. Um, so, yes. Um, Thank you for the introduction. Um, apologies to everyone in the SES theme who already heard this presentation from me in the meeting this morning, but hopefully everybody else uh, still has some interest in it. So I will be talking about the flow battery project uh, within ACES that we had running at uh, Monash University. So not just my work, but um, of a couple people as a general overview. So to start with a brief introduction, what is a flow battery and how does it work? So in a flow battery, the energy is stored in the liquid electrolyte, which is then uh, circulated through an electrochemical cell where it is charged or discharged at the electrodes that are separated by a membrane. And in this way, the power and the energy of the battery can be scaled independently from each other, which is especially convenient uh, for large scale, long duration energy storage systems. And a very convenient way to do this is to have the same electrolyte on both sides, as for example is done with the very common vanadium flow battery. But another way to do this is to have coordination complexes with redox active ligands in a non-aqueous solvent. So this project was um, sort of started with um, Diogo Cabral's work here at Monash. So he actually started with a cobalt complex, but that showed only very low um, cell voltage, which is bad for energy density. And so he went on to try the same with a nickel complex, which had a uh, much higher cell voltage. Uh, however, unfortunately, since the nickel coordination uh, number changes, the reactions are not fully reversible. So that had to be um, yeah, ditched. And then we went on to iron, which we are still uh, working on, which provides us with a um, cell voltage around 2.4 volt. And he had shown that the reversibility of the reactions, especially the ligand reductions, is very heavily um, dependent on the solvent that is used. Um, so here I tested uh, rather 
common aprotic solvents like acetonitrile or a propylene carbonate, but also a range of ionic liquids, which are also not the top choice for flow batteries as with the pumping and the high viscosity of ionic liquids um, usually don't go uh, very well with each other. And so to further enhance the energy density, we need to uh, increase the concentration of the active material. So Shu, uh, who now just finished his thesis, um, worked on heteroleptic complexes to see if that improves the solubility, which it actually does. But also always we have to keep in mind that the electrochemical compatibility is maintained. So um, he published some work on that, on the trade-offs between uh, these complexes, the solubility and the electrochemical properties. He went then on to uh, further look into these functionalized uh, ligands with uh, ester groups to see if that um, improves the solubility. And also he tested a range of anions to see how that influences solubility, conductivity and other properties. And then going from this uh, more basic work like cyclic voltammetry and other um, fundamental uh, electrochemical analysis, my work was to um, also do that, but also went on to some sort of um, cycling. So we're actually doing some charge discharge cycling, first doing the half cells. So this is the negative side of the battery where we uh, reduce the ligands back and forth and showing that that has a very good columbic efficiency that we can work with. And then also for the positive side where we oxidize the metal reversibly and also shown that these um, reactions basically work. It's now just the challenge to get a proper cell and then the right um, cycling and operation conditions for a battery. So we went on to work on a little uh, lab scale float cell uh, prototype battery and also managed to get some uh, charge discharge uh, cycling for the full cell uh, out of it. However, still not, um, yeah, perfect, not fully satisfying. So there's still work to be done on that. Um, however, it nicely shows how we came from doing very basic fundamental research to having a little um, prototype system that we can work on. And so with that, I'd like to uh, finish that quick overview and acknowledge and thank uh, all the people we worked with. So first of all, of course, our supervisors um, from Manash and from Deakin as well. Um, um, our colleagues uh, at, at the Manash University and yeah, generally the, the ACES network for all the support over this time. Thank you. Very good, very nice. Um... Again, sorry, no questions. However, uh, we're on to our last first speaker now, um, Carly Baker, who will talk about conducting polymers functional line of cholesterol for applications as a bioelectronic probe. If people have questions, put them into the chat. I'm sure we'll be able to pass the questions on to the, um, onto the speakers. So please feel free to put the questions in the chat. Okay, Carly, over to you. Okay, so hi. So my project is the biofunctionalization of conducting polymers for biointerface applications. So first, what is a biointerface? A strange word, right? It's just basically the region of contact between a material and a biological environment. So the goal is that we want to enhance solid adhesion, but in some materials that don't interface well with biosystems, we tend to have this macrophage encapsulation and the formation of scar tissue, which is often seen in metallic device implants, which leads to the formation of scar tissue over time. And this is a major problem in the world of implantable devices. But don't worry, because we can solve it with conducting polymers. So a conducting polymer is this soft organic material that conducts. And researchers have shown that unmodified conducting polymers tend to um, trigger foreign body response over time, which is characterized by this macrophage encapsulation. However, researchers have also shown that by attaching a biomolecule to this conducting polymer, we can enhance cell adhesion in vitro, which is the basis of my project. So we uh, our approach, my approach is to attach cholesterol to a 3,4 ethylene dioxythiophene monomer, as shown on your left. Um, so I synthesize this new monomer, which hasn't been synthesized before, and then chemically and electrochemically polymerized to form a edocholesterol polymer. 
And the idea is that this will slot into the cell membrane, thus enhancing cell adhesion and decreasing a foreign body response, which will solve our interface problems. Um, so the first question we need to ask is, is it functional in water? And um, after we determine this, it will show whether we can move on because it will potentially work in biological systems. So to measure this, we used cyclic voltammetry. So cyclic voltammetry, it scans from low potential to high potential and records a current of a conductive material. So we start with this neutral polymer, um, and then as we apply oxidation potential, we essentially dope the polymer, introducing electron hole. And this allows the flow of electrons along the backbone, enhancing the current. Then as we scan back from high potential to low potential, we um, essentially de-dope the polymer and then causing the current to decrease resulting in this neutral polymer. So we performed, so I, sorry, I performed cyclic voltammetry in organic solution and in aqueous solution. So in organic solution, I found that the polymer was electroactive compared to the control. <coughs> However, in aqueous solution, the CV was comparable to the background, which tells us this is not electroactive in water. So bummer, we, we have this material, but already shown that it's not useful. So I thought, okay, how can I make this polymer active in water? So maybe I can introduce a water soluble monomer um, with the cholesterol monomer and potentially increase the electroactivity. So I co-polymerized the two monomers by the same method um, to form this copolymer. And I showed that, yes, this is active in organics, but now it's actually active in water as well. So hooray, maybe we can solve this problem of <laughs> this bio-interface problem. Um, yeah. However, with all PhDs, there comes more problems. So what I, um, have done, I have started to characterize this polymer. And so, for example, here I have the in situ electrochemistry where I apply oxidation potential and I record the UV spectra. So I start at a um, low potential, so for example, here minus 0.8 volts, and then I recorded the reduced spectra in organics. And then as we um, increase the oxidation potential, we have the disappearance of this absorbance peak around 600, and then we have the appearance of this free carrier tail, indicating that we have doped the polymer or introduced this electron hole, which allows increased conjugation along the backbone. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, however, in, when I tried to do this in aqueous solution, what I found is that this polymer just disperses into the water. So this is an ongoing problem which I need to solve, which may be due to adhesion or the solubility of the polymer, um, but further work needs to be done in order to characterize this polymer because how can we save the planet with these materials if we can't show that they're gonna save the planet, right? Um, thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Um, thanks to all the six uh, Burster speakers, our excellent talks, I think we all agree with that. Um, given we're already on, on time, 3.35 by my watch, I think we can go straight on to the next speaker, if that's okay, uh, which is uh, Alex Harris, if Alex is available to start. Yeah, great. So Alex, you're online. Yep. Uh, talk about a framework for assessing the emergence of novel behaviours in complex systems. Over to you, Alex. All right. Okay, can you see the slide? Yep. Uh, one sec. Um, you might just want to change the presentation mode or? Yeah, I'll just, uh, okay. my camera on, camera on actually. Okay, well, you're too, yes, yes, please have your camera on, yes. There we go.
right. Okay, um, so I know you've you've all heard me talk quite a bit over the last few years about um, the electro tissue interface, looking at the the mechanisms that occur and the methods for analysing charge transfer at the electro tissue interface. And um, I thought that it might be nice to actually tell you a little bit more about the work which I've been doing over the last sort of year or two, uh, sort of looking into the future and. This is a project um, or a particular piece of work which I've been working with Kyle and Patrick on, which is about building a framework for assessing emergent behaviours in complex systems. Uh, it sort of expands the work from the electro tissue interface more into looking at what happens in complex tissue. So there's a, a very long history in understanding emergence, which goes back through philosophy of science, and that really sort of stemmed from these ideas of how does chemistry evolve or emerge from physics and how does biology emerge from chemistry. Um, but it, it sort of never really transferred away to um, useful applications for understanding uh, scientific research. Uh, it's got more applied looking at the way that properties uh, arise when systems start interacting together. So for instance, temperature and pressure are things that are quite well known where um, molecules might interact in a system and generate novel features. Of course, one which uh, a lot of people look at is uh, the emergence of life. That's because um, how does biology sort of, or life emerge from uh, a complex mixture of chemicals. But you also get things like, you know, the formation of, of um, movement of fit, school of fish. You know, you get these patterns of behavior. Um, how does that sort of arise out of the movements of an individual fish? And similarly, you know, the movements of a stock market or indeed how does consciousness arise out of the, either the brain or the body of a person. But one of the, the key issues that we're sort of addressing here is that it's a real difficulty in understanding what is truly an emergent property and what is just that we don't know enough about the fundamental properties of a system or, or the particular elements that create a system. So we've been trying to build this uh, framework that helps us actually identify what is an emergent phenomena. And we've come up with four key features. Uh, the first one is that the system has, it's a collective. And that is the emergent behaviors arise through the interaction of elements. It's not a property of the individual elements in a system. The second is that it's collaborative. Um, so we say that a system itself has an emergent phenomena. It's not an individual element displays an emergent phenomena. Uh, and the emergent behaviors, they're also, they're dependent. So there are certain properties of the emergent system are actually dependent on the behaviors of the particular elements. So for instance, movement, a system might be able to move, but all the individual elements themselves are also able to move. And then the, the key aspect is that in some sense, novel beha uh, emergent behaviors are in some sense novel. So the, the, an emergent system generates a novel feature relative to the actual underlying elements that are composing it. Um, so novelty is quite a difficult one. Um, and we're sort of trying to identify that it can arise uh, through a whole range of different forms. Um, so for instance, if you were to look at a system, you might say that emergent feature it can't be defined in the same way as the, the way that you would define the composing elements in a system. Another novel feature might be the degree of complexity of the system could be different to the, uh, the underlying behavior. And a key property is irreducibility. So the, the properties that you define of a system, you literally cannot reduce that down to some basic description of the underlying elements There's something has actually emerged out of them. There's a initial about locality. Um, so the, the properties or dynamics of a system can be different across short and long ranges. Uh, and the measurability as well. So you may not be able to measure emergent behavior in the same way that you measure the fundamental components in the system. Uh, and really there's a, quite often there's an issue of a non-linearity being present within your system, whether it's the behaviors of the elements or the interactions, there's often a non-linear component that generates the emergent behavior. And 
really one of the basic aspects is predictability. And that is you, you, can, you can't necessarily predict the properties of a, an emergent system based on what you know of the behavior of the composing elements. Um, so we then get a whole bunch of contingent features. So these are things that we say are not actually necessary in an emergent system, but quite often in, in the discussions about emergence is that these are considered to be requirements of emergence. And in particular complexity, um, the discussions are basically saying that you need to have a complex system uh, and increasing complexity gives rise to emergent behavior. And we're actually identifying that you can get emergent phenomena from very simple um, elements or very simple interactions and complexity itself is not actually a requirement. But complexity, diversity and scale can all play a role and are descriptions, uh, descriptions of um, parts of emergent behavior. Similarly, um, systems can be context dependent. You can take a, a system and put it into a different environment and that can then affect the behavior of your, your emergent phenomena. Um, your measurability, so it can often be very easy to measure an emergent behavior compared to trying to measure the behavior of every single element within a system. And that leads to the fact that it can be very easy to, to model a simplified system uh, or a simplified uh, version of an emergent behavior because you don't need to incorporate all of the behaviors of the composing elements. Um, also, we have a, a multi-level effect. So you can have a system which is generating emergent phenomena, which then itself generates a higher level emergent or novel behavior. And another one is multiple realizability. So we can get very similar behaviors of emergence, but get them from very different types of systems. Um, and another one which has been discussed quite a lot is this idea of upwards and downwards causation. Um, so for instance, can, the, can consciousness control the behavior of cells or proteins, for instance? And we're actually, just, uh, in this discussion, we're identifying that the, it's very difficult to identify what is actually causing something else. Um, and essentially the, the discussion around causation is actually quite tangential to whether there's an emergent phenomena itself. It's not actually a requirement. And finally, we've identified universality in that you can generate, um, say, a, a, a universal law or uh, some sort of uh, description of an emergent phenomena with reference to certain properties in the system. So overall, we can sum up that basically emergence is the result of an interaction of a number of components, uh, depending on the type of components or the particular arrangement. And so you can have very simple models where you can describe the, the properties of the individual elements and you can predict behavior based on more complex or larger systems that allows you to give certain reliable extrapolations from your model. But at some point, your, your model breaks down, either the number of components, the type, the arrangement is leading to some sort of novel behavior, which is no longer fitting into the simple model that you're using to understand the system. So I just want to now give you some examples. So this sort of makes a little bit more sense to you. Um, so I want to start with something basic, looking at emergence in chemistry. Um, so if you can imagine, um, we've got a, a molecule of hydrogen and a molecule of oxygen. They're both sitting in separate spaces. They're not interacting in any way. Now we can model them or we can do experiments on them and we describe them, give them certain properties uh, and say that, you know, you, you take your hydrogen molecule, you put it into a different environment, but it's still acting in the same sort of way. And now all of a sudden we're going to introduce these two molecules next to each other. They're going to start interacting in some way and they might generate reaction intermediates. They might go on and react to form water. We get changes in molecular structure, polarity, all sorts of different new behaviors that can arise from that interaction. And the question that we've got for this system then is when you've, you've, you're getting these two molecules interacting, could you predict those new properties from the two separate entities that were at the start of the reaction? And another example I wanna give is when we've got say one water molecule, and then we're going to um, put large numbers of water molecules together. 
So we're increasing the, the number of components within the system. And once again, there, you know, there's a whole bunch of different properties that you might understand or know from a single water molecule, but when you put it into a larger collective, you get a whole range of new properties that might arise. So hydrogen bonding can occur. You can generate temperature or pressure, states of matter, surface tension from the droplet or crystal structure, proton jumping. And again, so we're looking at, there's a whole range of new properties that can emerge from a system that you wouldn't necessarily see from the individual uh, element within that. And just another example as well um, is emergence in neuroscience. So obviously consciousness is the big one that sort of gets raised quite a lot, but it's very difficult to get stuck into it because there's no real agreed definition of what consciousness is, what's required, um, how does it form. Um, so we can actually break uh, neuroscience down into more fundamental components and look at what here's, for instance, a neuron and that, you know, we could model that or we understand a single neuron on its own has certain uh, structure and components within it. Um, and we might be able to, for instance, move it into a, a, a different lab and it still has the same system. We, we wouldn't expect its properties necessarily to change. But all of a sudden, if you put a neuron next to another neuron, you might get the formation of synapse. And that means you might have a formation of new cellular structures or loss of cellular structures, changes in protein expression and ability for the cells to communicate via new methods. And you probably weren't able to predict the formation of synapse if you were looking at the two neurons completely separately. And similarly, if you had a neuron interacting with an oligodendrocyte, we, you may have no idea that when you put these two cells together that you can form myelin, generating a new cell structure and changing things like the electrophysiology of the, the system that you can generate there. Okay, so there are just a couple of very brief examples and I probably you're, you're looking at this and just going, all right, well, so what, you know, what's, what's the use of this to me? Um, well, generally the approach to science is very reductionistic. You know, we generally assume that, you know, we take components from, from a bottle, we shove it in with something else. And we, we assume that when we mix these things together, we can just add up their components and we, we understand how this complex system is going to work. But actually, when you're getting emergent behaviors or novel behaviors emerging from their interactions, you need to actually understand the types of interactions um, that go on between those particular elements and how they change when they're, they're interacting. So in order to understand and control emergent features, you need to know how a system is composed. And in order to do that, you need to then build a whole range of different models that capture all the necessary features of a system. So just in conclusion, um, we've basically we've drawn up a framework that says emergence requires a collective, collaborative, dependent uh, and novel system behaviour where complexity is not actually a requirement. Um, the system behaviour can be affected by both the number, type and the arrangement of the components in it. And in order to understand uh, emergence, you just you need to build a whole range of different models to understand what features are, are actually important for understanding your particular um, problem. Um, so what we're trying to do now is sort of build up the collab collaboration. So uh, we're looking for people that are working in all sorts of different complex systems that are interested in building different models. And we're looking at sort of any sort of uh, discipline as well. So whether it's you know, mathematical modeling, we're building uh, different types of complex mathematical models. Uh, electrical circuits as well, we're building uh, different types of software packages, as well as neuroscience and materials. So, uh, just acknowledge all the people that are sort of currently involved in the project and all the funding that we've received. Thank you. Fascinating. Uh, any questions? Maybe time for a question or two. Um, so I, I was looking at it, it's interesting from the point of view, say, of a, of a, of a battery electrolyte electrolyte interface, you bring those two together, something happens there and you can't predict what's going to happen. So yep. you say there's a way, way of modeling that mathematically, I'm, I'm not fully sure I understand exactly what you're doing. But yeah, um, so, so one of the, the things that we're talking about with the electronics when we're looking at emergence, um, so how do novel functions arise from the composition of the components in a system? So 
it took us a little while to really figure out what is a what is a component. Um, so if you can imagine that you've got a, a, a cardboard box and inside it you've got a resistor and a capacitor. And if you were to look at all of those individual things, you wouldn't necessarily know that when you stick them together into a circuit, it actually does something. Mm -hmm. Current actually flows through the circuit. The, the, and LED generates light, you know, unless you had that, that basic knowledge, you didn't know that that system itself would actually do something. Mm. And we know that there's um, minimum requirements to build a functioning circuit. You have to have a power source and you have to have a closed circuit. Um, so that's essentially your, your basic electrical system. Um, and then if you want to develop more complex emergent behaviors, do you want to generate something that's, for instance, building a filter might be another emergent phenomena um, or building something that um, is able to move or generates light and detects something else as well. That, you know, you can get multiple layers and, you know, it's, it's as I say, it's something we're just sort of building on. So it'd be interesting to talk to more people to get their, their feedback. Fascinating. Any other questions from anybody before we move on? Uh, comment from Jeff Spence. Can you comment on how your thinking has been influenced by the non-scientists in your team? Yeah, well, uh, this was really founded um, by working with Patrick. And so, you know, the whole work itself wouldn't have kicked off without him. Uh, so his philosophy of science with the, the background in emergence. Um, so really, if this had just been Lausanne and me working uh, without Patrick, then we would have just focused on you know, developing a tissue model and characterizing it and maybe looking at biology. But having Patrick in there has, has sort of pushed us into this fundamental understanding of what is emergence, teasing apart what's, what's the model, um, what should we be building and understanding about that. Um, and then feeding in Kyle with uh, his mathematical expertise as well, it sort of opens up a whole different aspect of, you know, can maths be emergent and can software generate novel behaviours, which you know, has been really interesting. Fascinating. Um, I wish we had more time to discuss it further, but we don't. So we'll thank you again for a great talk and move on to our next speaker. Here is uh, Dr. Hao Zhu from Wollongong. Ready, talking about 3D printed soft prosthetic hand with embedded actuation and soft sense capabilities. Over to you. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the long title. So, my project is about developing um, a soft robotic prosthetic hand and controlled by an um, intuitive uh, uh, human-machine interface. So when I talk to the, uh, some uh, prosthetic hand users, one of the biggest complaints uh, from them is uh, they don't have many options. So in this in this field, the options are very limited. Like they, many of them still use the body power the prosthetic hand, which was a nightmare. Uh, one of the um, patients, she, she complained that every day she needs to spend more than half an hour to put the prosthetic hand on. And uh, it's definitely uh, not, a good up, not, not a good for her. So uh, robotic prosthetic hands is, uh, is preferred by many of the, the users. <coughs> but the robot, uh, at the moment, the robotic prosthetic hands, uh, the price is very high. Um, it's uh, about like fifty thousand dollars. Some uh, uh, we talked to one one uh, user. He has uh, uh, two two hands, and it cost him three hundred thousand dollars. So that's too much, and many people can't afford them. Even some people they still they waiting for the insurance. It's a long waiting list. So uh, what our aim is to we want to uh, bring the cost down. And uh, another problem of the, about the, the current hand is uh, the weight. So the current uh, commercial hand, it's, uh, it, uh, most of them they are about uh, 500 grams, which is uh, heavier than our biological hand. And uh, as, as you know, the, because the printed hand is like a foreign, foreign object, 
for the user, so you will feel even heavier. So uh, we we want to build a, a new hand with uh, low low uh, light light weight, and uh, the third third one is uh, the main uh, bottleneck. It's a current uh, hand that is still controlled uh, by uh, on and off sequential control, which is not intuitive at all. So we have this idea about so the AC software by the hand. Uh, Many people, uh, I talked to some uh, some manufacturers. Uh, they 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 using these uh, uh, rigid uh, traditional uh, robotic hands. So they say, oh, they, these hands can can produce a high force. But uh, when we uh, think about the, the, the application, the actually the, not many users they 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 need a very high force. And in, in like in some cases, especially for household activity. Safety is, a, is, a, is more is a preferred, is more desirable. One patient, she, she said that when she tried to shake hand with her husband, she had accidentally hurt him because it's a, the rigid hand just uh, squeezed too, too hard. And the one, another patient, he, uh, he complained, he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't dare to change the diaper for, her, for his baby because he's just uh, scared of uh, uh, hurting, hurting him. So, we have this idea doing using soft robotics to build a new hand. So this uh, soft robotic hand it's uh, in uh, mechanically compliant, so it can provide us a safe human interaction, which is uh, is critical for the pretend users because these hands gonna interact with people, and uh, the the hand is uh, come with a monolithic structure, so it requires a minimum uh, assembly. So it can can reduce the cost in this in this field, and uh, they can be three D printed. The the customization is uh, it's important. Before I did, uh, I wasn't aware of that. After I, I until I talked to this uh, user, one user she uh, she said, uh, I, I so I showed showed them the, the our software with hands, and she said, oh that's great. Can I print a, a, a new hand? Just similar to my my residue hand, because uh, the, the, all the commercial hands they are all the same. Some are too big for the user, some are too small. And they say, "Oh, can I can I scan my uh, existing the other hand and just mirror the hand so the, the left hand can be similar to the right hand?" So this uh, uh, this hand they are three D printable. Our new hand three D printable, so can can give the high uh, customization, which is very important too. And uh, like we can also make the actuators a 3D printable, the sensors, even the batteries. And the hand is a, is a, is a low weight. It's a, only about a, one third or half of the, the commercial hand's weight. And all the, the cost is, uh, is much <coughs> cheaper than the current hands on the market. So uh, the, the eight, so this AC software we can, can do uh, diverse uh, gestures. If uh, can grasp a different uh, objects, and uh, also yeah, so well, whatever uh, whichever hand we use, either a soft hand or rigid hand, we we need to control the hand. So, uh, so as I said before, the biggest bottleneck now is the the, the user hand interface. So, as uh, the traditional my electric control, so use a two. Uh, uh, so, uh, surface uh, electrical mobility electrodes. So one on the front and uh, the other one at the back <coughs> is, uh, on the residue uh, forearm. So the, it can only provide on and off control of uh, one one DOF. So when they need to switch to another gesture, it ha has to be manually done. <clears throat> Thanks to the, the past development in uh, AI technology, now we can using machine learning algorithm to do this pattern recognition. So we, uh, we put uh, more, more sensors on the forearm and uh, using this, uh, this algorithm to, to find uh, the patterns of, the, of the, the muscle activity so we can detect the user intention better. There's already some uh, commercial products here. Um, the the Mile Plus by Autobock and the Co-ops they are already put in clinical use. 
tax, uh, they are very expensive. And uh, uh, one, one, uh, one customer, he has, she has uh, the, the, the arm and the hand and the crop system cost uh, more than $300,000. So that's still so it's high and it's very expensive. Not, uh, it's uh, discouraging many users to, to try uh, the pattern recognition system. And also the, the, the new, uh, the, this system uh, requires the, the, the user to have a new forearm socket. So it's also uh, a big uh, drawback. So uh, we developed the, the pattern recognition sy system by using some low cost uh, EMG electrodes. So, the, so the, those are commercial systems, they use a medical grade electrodes, which are expensive. But expensive doesn't, mean, um, doesn't necessarily mean uh, good uh, for, the, for some particular application. The, those uh, medical grade uh, uh, electrodes, they, they have uh, working frequency can be uh, up to 900 hertz. So this one is uh, 200 hertz. But in, uh, in terms of the uh, pattern gesture recognition, they work as well as those uh, medical grade electrodes. So the, 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 the algorithm uh, we developed and uh, it can, can do uh, intuitive uh, uh, hand movements and the, the, the training time is short and the prediction is reliable and uh, can do a real-time recognition and the control. Next. Uh, so the, that's one way we, we try to use a low cost uh, EM sensor. The other way is uh, we, we try to use only two electrodes, which is uh, in, in line with the current uh, configuration of uh, the existing uh, users. So for the existing user, they don't, they don't need to replace the whole arm socket. And uh, we only aim at four to six most commonly used uh, patterns, because uh, for them, for the user, they need to memorize all these patterns. So like if you have 10, 20 patterns, if they can't memorize them, it's uh, pointless. So four to six, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a good number um, after talking to them. And uh, so we believe this, this can, uh, can, can encourage uh, many users to, to try um, the pattern recognition control. So we, we did um, uh, one preliminary, preliminary experiment to test uh, in Princess Wells Hospital, ask uh, one patient to, to try on this system. And uh, it, it, it didn't work perfectly, but it, it showed the feasibility of this, uh, this system. And uh, uh, one of, uh, one of the, 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 the thing behind this is uh, I, I talked to the one, uh, one user, uh, he said, um, he kind of uh, forgot how to use uh, use his hand. So, like uh, if this system, the commercial system, is very expensive, then it's gonna be a long waiting time. So this time is just wasted. So if we can build a, a compact, a low cost system, then uh, he or she can 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 try on this system uh, earlier, which is uh, it, which will like make the, the rehab rehabilitation much easier for them. So uh, in this uh, video, I show uh, using only two electrodes to control uh, a robot hand. So I performed um, these four uh, uh, gestures in real time, and this hand is uh, lent by uh, one of our collaborators, uh, the Tasca hand. Um, 
So um, after we, uh, after I, I did, uh, we did this um, uh, pattern recognition system, uh, we we just find find one problem: the the existing hand uh, uh, wasn't designed for pattern recognition. It's it designed for the old control system. So when we uh, so the, the the old hands they are uh, they have the neutral position. Like if you view a switch from one gesture to another. Uh, just, it's always go back to the neutral open position, mm -hmm. and the, all the, the hand movements they are pre-programmed. Pre but in the uh, for the direct control, it's no problem at all. But for the pattern recognition system, now you you don't know where where, where the hand starts, and you don't know where the hand stops. So the self collision is a is a risk now. So so the existing hand they are all open loop. There's no sense at all. So the, the system itself doesn't know well. Like uh, which uh, where the hand is, like uh, where, where the fingers are. So uh, the current hand cannot conduct real pattern recognition control. So we need to put the, the sensor smartly to the, the hands. So with the this uh, we call this uh, AC software hand version two. We have this 3D printed uh, monolithic, monolithic, monolithic structure, and with the embedded soft sensor. Uh, for the joint position and the fingertip touch sensing, we actually touched one paper uh, uh, with uh, with this idea. So the the new hand can do real time finger position tracking. It can it can better supporting the pattern recognition uh, control, and uh, so the, the self collision can be avoided. The, the the neutral position can be eliminated, and we can do the with the uh, with the this uh, the, the knowledge of the. The, the, the fingers position so we can do the motion planning and the graph control can improve the, the graph quality so it can can do more intuitive hand movements and the, all these movements can be more efficient and save our energy so this uh, it, the, the new hand can also do a different gesture and different graph and uh, it, it can it can detect the contact so when it's a uh, contact on the, Contact some object, it can stop there, and, and so the, the current, like uh, the, the energy, it can can be can be saved. So here's the summary. So um, we developed the soft robotic hands, which are try to make them uh, financially uh, affordable and the lightweight, and the pattern recognition system can make the this control more intuitive, and um, and these. Um, these hands um, are, can 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 significant, significantly improve the quality of the people's life, and the future work uh, we uh, we will improve the the pattern recognition system and also improve the, the hand itself, and we will continue to uh, collaborate with the Princeton Hospital to conduct more patient trials and uh, the commercial in terms of a commercial translation. There's a huge potential we can commercialize the hand itself and also we can commercialize the, the soft sensor and also the, the pattern recognition system. So uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, ACES to provide uh, such a wonderful opportunity to, to for this uh, project. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, thank you, Howard. In the interest of time, so I'm conscious we're in hard deadline, uh, we'll probably leave any questions to time. Uh, our last scientific speaker today will be Professor Kayun Wei, uh, talking about the engineering materials for multifunctional batteries. Thank you, Kayun. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, today I'll be talking about uh, engineering the material for multifunctional batteries. And for battery, the law is not an indispensable part of our dense life. And they use a portable device, transporting vehicles, and also they use it to storage the energy generated from renewable sources. And uh, now, and uh, to uh, improve the quality of life, and uh, there is a certain group of personalized electronic. And uh, this kind of electronic, you know, now they can conform uh, the. Oh, here. 
and uh, let's see that flex, the flexible electronics variable get where get it or mini tra uh, the trans trans transcend electronic for that uh, you know, comfort. They all required that development of multifunctional energy storage units to drive. This means you know, to just not that uh, common materials for the batteries or for the inner storage of high performance, high electricity, high power density, also need the properties of compliant, flexible, biodegradable state. And for just to talk about some medical implants for the battery, we can see here, and uh, and usually uh, you can see you know in the medical implants the battery is the bottom neck, and uh, you from the uh, left corner the people you can see the battery is occupied most of the volumes and uh, also most of the bit for this one. And because the batteries have a lot of toxic materials, we need the strongest to encapsulate. And if we want to try to remove the case, then we need you know uh, in, you know by combining materials, electrons, and we, if we use body fluid as electrolyte, then we can effect implantation in the human human uh, human body human body. And this is a table in the right corner. The table we said, okay, why the body fluid has a, can be used in the iron transport medium? You can see the conductivity is very close and also is that kind of, of the normal electrolyte. For the medical, you know, like in plant, there's two types one is long term, one is the penetratory or transcendent medical, uh, medical implants. For the transcendent one, this is normally we can model the disease or drug release, and normally they just use it for short term. If they use the biodegradable, you know, to drive, and this is the is ideal absorption. And this type of batteries make it can disappear, and it sell, you know, at the program mission and after use. Then they say you know, they know they just avoid the surgical remove and also it's not at the worst effect. And for these biodegradable batteries and you know just the normal uh, battery requirement, also you know you can see here as like electrodes can be deposited while the metab metabolic action or hydrolysis, and we also use the electrolyte or if not. For that, uh, you know, electrode materials and the common strategy is true. Why is we just, you know, it creates new materials and intrinsically biodegradable electrode materials. This is very challenging. And the common approach used with composite, we make composite electrodes. And in this material, in this material, it's one component. It's normally the biopolymer. These are responsible or uh, is for the biodegradation uh, profile. Another component is the current and the available electron material. They is responsible for the natural chemical performance. And here I just talk about the two work. Is that is uh, you know our PhD our graduate PhD student Xiao Hongjia. He used like a bipolymer silk fabric. And then the first work is about the silk is electrode is the silk and the polypyrrole film. You can see here we just you know, deposit the poly the polytetral on one side and then leave enough space still that uh, you know super film for that uh, for that uh, you know enzyme to attack and then for the uh, by degradation. You can see here that is you know some enzyme degradation. From the photo, you can see after 15 days, it is converted into the small parts. And this is another work is we just we you know, not electron, we also use you know, a collaboration with the Manash University. We just fabricate some you know, polymer electrolyte, use the silk and the liquid. Then we ensemble of four devices, and the like cathode is <coughs> gold and the silk. And the, and, the, and the silk and the anode is the same is magnesium 
and they use this one because the, you know, uh, the laminate use the packet material is silk. Because you know, in that right corner, this uh, the refiner can see, you know, if this battery is very, this encapsulated battery in the air is very stable. But the very, very immersed in the PDS, PDS electrolyte, and the it is, you know, the performance is only can run is about 75 or 80 minutes. So we want to try to, you know, control the biodegradation file. We just add another, you know, silver film. We can see now we can, you know, prolong that, uh, that uh, discharge time to is about 175 minutes. And then this is some photos about this whole device, the biodegradation profile. And then in the bubble protein solution at 73 degrees, we can see you know, after 45 degrees, it's the only layer of what's left. And the last one, I just you know, copied from literature. And the last one, that before letter two work we did, it's a prime battery, or it's based on magnesium battery, uh, it's, uh, it's magnesium uh, the batteries. And the last one is the rechargeable sodium ion batteries. And the last is the also, they use the is you know to fiber type and then they can directly in you know inject it into you know into the body part and the less performance later is you know in is is in vivo in vivo is electrical performance is in a red in a red you can see here that is uh mind the charge discharge profile or not by separation file. And the letter is reported, the whole battery is disappeared after that 10 days, 10 weeks. Another work we are did is this is a defense project, and we all know for these smart batteries, like that is a challenge problem is several along the way. And for this map, we just think you know, from this electrolyte, we try to see, you know, and you know for the this my battery that accident happens is when you endure the, the fuels and the, the rate is much, much higher. The common abuse is three types, it's a mechanical abuse, <coughs> and the thermal abuse, and the electrochemical electro, electro abuse. And uh, that student, uh, GT, we just uh, you know, published one review paper on this topic. And uh, today, just we'll talk some little bit about the mechanical you know, abuse. We can see, you know, it's like it is for the, if we, you know, in the common electrolyte, we add some fillers, and some it have the share sitting electrons effect, just, you know, as the applied share rate, the viscosity is decreasing. The another one we can see that it is increasing. Let us see some videos here. This is the share signal. Can see here, this one share let the uh, let is share signal. This is share signal. You can see when the ball dropping here, it will stop, not just stop, it will bounce. A little bit, you can see it starts to bounce in a little bit, and uh, we can see this one. This is a very high share signal effect. The ball can you know, totally bounce back. So we try to you know, develop that we use this effect we develop that is a share seeking electrolyte. This electrolyte is the process that the common electrolyte material is the eye conducting. Also it possesses the share seeking effect. 
And uh, this electrical light can block my blood, you know, protection of cancer mechanical fields. It will be just utilizing that the shear thickening effect. And this is just some uh, schematic robot, how this can protect. They are now, you know, when the battery, you know, this the liquid, you know, electrolyte, when they experience the cell deformation, normally they will cause the cell deformation result in the internal short circuit and all electrolyte leakage. Then that can be induced, like a fire or explosion. And if we use that is electrolyte with the shear sifting effect upon that mechanical impact, and then later will buffer the electrolyte, buffer the impact, and then keep it working. And for my summary, that is very opening. I think I just use that uh, you know current, you know available chemistry, and use this interdisciplinary experience. We can create the new materials with the normal you know, properties, the new properties. And okay, this is my document. It's a golden for the support. Also, this is the time that was Post down was the short term and the letter is the share sickness by GT. For Chen Chen, she has you know, done that uh, gradual security sleep. It doesn't use that uh, also five batteries. When the user is uh, one is uh, provide the electricity, the other is uh, for sales stimulation, but uh, today I don't have time to talk. And also other graduate students. And uh, my collaborator, that is the writer, here to say, I also said that. All my colleagues, thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening.